Dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome to France, to a virtual France for many of you, but to a France uh, happy to welcome you, to hear from you, and to interact with you. You have just joined the first international conference on migration organized by the Collaborative Migrations Institute, l'Institut Convergence Migration. My name is François Iran. I am the founding director of this institute. It's a federation of researchers created partially in a reaction to the so-called refugee crisis. The French government had launched uh, ambitious calls for projects to create uh, centers of excellence in all sciences, but none of them was addressing migration. In 2016, we succeeded in mobilizing uh, four research organizations and three universities on this topic and we were even selected by international jury. The Migration Institute is funded for eight years up to 2025, and this conference marks an important milestone since we are halfway through our mandate. Our members are recruited on an individual basis. They remain members of their organization or universities, but they agree to work together on research projects that we fund. We currently have 400 fellows across France, researchers and uh, doctoral students, not counting uh, foreign fellows. Uh, the range of disciplines is very wide, sociology, sociology, anthropology, political science, history, geography, urban studies, demography, law, architecture, uh, the arts, public health, epidemiology, etc. Our ambition is to ensure that these disciplines intersect and fertilize each other. It's easier said than done, as you can imagine, but after almost four years of operation, I can say that, uh, yes, we are on the way. We also attach uh, considerable importance to the dissemination of results, to the mobilization of partners from the civil society, in general, to the science society relationship. The refugee crisis prompted us to work together, but we don't simply react to current uh, migration developments. We try to study migration in depth without any time and duration limit. We are interested in all kinds of migration, international or domestic, apprehended from the countries of origin as from the countries of destination, including border and transit areas from antiquity to the uh, present day. Let me now uh, illustrate with some slides the general context and uh, general background uh, in the quantitative perspective I'm uh, familiar with. But you will see that many of the uh, features I am insisting um, on, I'm underlining, have uh, uh, direct echoes, we have direct echoes in the presentations, in the several presentations of this uh, conference. Uh, next, please. <coughs> uh, the first uh, uh, point I would like to highlight is the fact that uh, the global structure of international migration is not at all uh, what uh, the common wisdom uh, could uh, suggest. Uh, here in this uh, uh, slide, you can see from the Global Bilateral Migration Database that uh, uh, the, the number of residents, of foreign residents, uh, classified according to the country of origin and to the country of destination, do not confirm at all the idea that the less developed countries would migrate necessarily to the most uh, developed countries. I have taken here as an uh, the, the human development index, other indicators could be taken, of course. And you, next, please, you can see that uh, this area, people who, well, I have classified all the countries in a 10, uh, step uh, scale from 1 to 10. And here in this uh, yellow uh, ellipsis, you can see uh, people who were born in uh, uh, less developed countries and are residing in another country in the same levels, one or two. And here, this includes essentially migration within Sub Saharan Africa. Um, 
the uh, if we uh, were uh, attaching important to the if we were uh, believing in the common wisdom that uh, the poorest country uh, countries necessarily migrate to the richest country uh, the area which will uh, be uh, uh, disproportionately represented in this graph would be this one next please this area on the right, and it's not the case. What the uh, refugee crisis has uh, changed since the time uh, this uh, data have been uh, uh, collected is the fact that uh, areas, uh, countries with the level of development number three or number four are now most more, more represented in the last, uh, in the richest country. Next, please. And you can see that here are, for example, the Syrians to uh, Germany, to Austria, to Sweden, or uh, to France. And uh, these uh, towers, let's say, have been increased, have been have doubled, let's say, since 2015. But it hasn't changed the general structure of the uh, global flows, the global uh, the migration stock, as uh, the United Nations say. And what we observe in, is, in fact, is the fact that there is an important migration within the Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. There is an important migration within the most developed uh, countries. But the bulk of the migrations, illustrated, for example, by Mexicans in the US, is uh, represented by countries which are more or less at uh, uh, the half of the uh, scale of development migrating to the uh, more developed countries. So the idea that there is a sort of natural slope which will reconduct the, the less developed countries to migrate to uh, the richest or the most developed one does not exist. If instead of taking the human development index, you take, for example, the fertility levels, uh, including in the dynamic and dynamic perspective, it's exactly the same. No, there is no uh, general propensity of overfertile countries to migrate to underfertile countries. And there are more counter examples and examples. And for example, all the Balkan countries with very, very low fertility level are not attracting people from the uh, highest uh, fertility uh, level countries. And we could uh, also. Uh, raise a question whether the climate migration or environmental migrations do they follow the same pattern can we say that for example people for uh, from the, the condition the the, the, the the driest countries would necessarily migrate to uh, the countries with tempered uh, climate this is not uh, established at all and we will have some uh, contribution on this difficult topic about the question whether uh, the migration flows uh, uh, determined by climate change uh, are correspond to displacement within the same countries or to real international migration and through which variables. This is one of the interesting points we will uh, uh, examine in the, in the rest of the conference. Now, uh, next please. Uh, another representation of the same uh, structure is uh, given here by uh, indicators of uh, overrepresentation, as we say in French, or disproportionate representation uh, in English. And we can see that people born in a country with low income, as defined by the, the World Bank, are more likely to migrate to a country with uh, low income. So the poorer a country is, the less it migrates to a rich country, which is exactly the opposite of the common view on this uh, on, uh, the migration determinants. Next, please. Another uh, uh, series of graphs I would uh, like to show you is uh, the very uh, uh, the huge variety of attracti attractiveness of Western countries vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the migrants. And I shall measure it uh, through the residence permits added to the free movements the free movements uh, corresponding to uh, the uh, uh, international agreements that prevail mainly uh, within the uh, European Union. 
Next, please. Here is uh, the percentage distribution of new permanent permits of stay uh, in uh, the bulk of the refugee crisis. And uh, these data come from OECD. And what is interesting here in this kind of data, you have not only the uh, new permanent uh, permits for uh, uh, residents, for the permanent residents, but OECD has added, has reconstituted or uh, estimated the uh, number of people who uh, settle in the country uh, 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 thanks to the uh, free circulation, the free movement uh, um, provisions. And uh, in the upper part of the graph, you can see connect Canada and Australia with their point system, with their selective systems. More than half of the migrants who uh, uh, were settled in 2016 correspond to a work migration, including the family uh, that is joining immediately uh, the laureates of the of this uh, competition. Family, uh, classical family unification is in uh, brown, and the uh, green part correspond to humanitarian uh, permits. And you can see how this uh, distribution, percentual distribution, varies considerably from one uh, country to another, and we are here within the Western country. You can see, for example, the gray zone correspond to the free movement. Look, for example, at UK in the middle of the graph, or Germany in the lower part of the graph. You can see that these countries, and UK, of course, it was before the Brexit, are extremely attractive vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the European Union. They attract people from Central Europe, Poles, Hungar Hungarians, uh, Slovaks, uh, uh, people from Baltic countries, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, while the, the work migration uh, is uh, much lower, of course, than in the systems of uh, uh, point system competition. Uh, it is interesting to see that countries like France is using in a very important proportion family unification, following the, the laws in this uh, uh, the, the European uh, the Convention of Human Rights uh, law, while other countries, such as uh, Germany, for example, or UK, uh, doesn't uh, use family unification uh, permits in the same uh, proportion. And, Strangely enough, there are very few debates uh, within Europe about uh, these uh, huge disparities between countries, in the, despite the fact that in general, they, well, normally they should follow more or less the same international uh, conventions. Now, of course, it's a little strange to uh, give the same importance to USA, for example, and, uh, and Austria. And here is, uh, next please, here is the same graph, but I, the thickness of the bar is now proportional to the numbers of, of immigrants. <coughs> the numbers correspond to a thousand. So uh, 696 means that in 2018, the US has uh, um, granted uh, permanent permits of stay to nearly 700,000 people in the world. It's a considerable. Uh, it's a huge number, of course. You can see that France uh, is also one of the European countries uh, which has granted the most, uh, more important number of, of family uh, permits, uh, while uh, um, you can see that Germany uh, in this year has, uh, of course, is still very attractive vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the European Union, the grey zone, but it has also uh, received a lot of, uh, registered a lot of asylum seekers and uh, attracted a lot of, uh, of workers. Next, please. Uh, to summarize uh, what has uh, happened uh, at the beginning of the crisis and in the following years, I have extracted here uh, three uh, stripes, let's say three bars, uh, for each country, France, UK, and Germany. You can see that uh, uh, the crisis for France had, had, had uh, rather little impact. 
Uh, UK has been uh, disturbed by uh, the campaign against uh, the Brexit. You can see that uh, the free circulation coming essentially from Europe and from other parts of the, the Commonwealth has uh, reduced. Um, but uh, and uh, they have there, there is no strong visible impact of the refugee crisis, while uh, Germany is completely the opposite. It's really Germany which is a fantastic uh, caritative power, charities power, uh, um, which has really um, reacted to the crisis and uh, changed, at least in 2016, uh, the structure and the number, the quantities of uh, permits uh, granted to the different categories. Now, um, at, in the last part of my presentation, next please, I will try to take stock of the refugee crisis in Europe, say in 2014, but in another, uh, with a, 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 another tool. Next, please. Uh, since 2015 up to now, so in seven years, over seven years, uh, nearly two million people were registered as first asylum seekers uh, in Europe plus, uh, let's uh, the European Union plus uh, Switzerland, Norway, uh, Iceland, etc. And uh, out of this uh, nearly two million people, uh, um, 5.6 million people, I'm sorry, Germany has uh, registered uh, one third of the total, France uh, one eighth, and then uh, the other countries are following. I've represented only the countries with registered more than uh, 100,000 requests during these uh, four years. And so you can see here the uh, huge disparities uh, uh, between uh, within uh, Europe. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Next, please. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping this one. No, uh, thank you. No, no, please, uh, the, the previous one. The previous one. Thank you. Uh, in order to understand exactly how the burden has been uh, distributed among uh, the different country burden, of course, with quotes, uh, I have represented here uh, the quart quarterly number of asylum requests, which have been registered by uh, several European countries per million population. So proportionally to the population of the destination country. And you can see that Germany, of course, proportionally to its population, despite the fact that it's a, uh, it has 80 million inhabitants, remains the first country who, was, uh, who accepted to register um, uh, asylum seekers in 2015 and 2016. I observe that the famous Angela Merkel statement at the last day of August 2015 has not opened the, the, the waves. It has not launched the movement. It was just, uh, it, it has accompanied the movement, the reception movement, which was already, which already began in 2014. And then, as you know, the deal uh, uh, between Germany and Turkey and then immediately between Europe and Turkey has put an end, a drastic end to all this uh, movement of uh, generosity. And then the countries, I will not comment the evolution of each country. Italy, for example, is directly, uh, um, is directly uh, of course, impacted by the, the political change, the Salviani period, etc. But you can see that a country like Greece, except of course in the COVID-19 uh, period, is now uh, wearing a very uh, important burden uh, proportionally to its population, uh, while uh, France is just in the, in the average and UK has remained completely out of the scene. This is uh, uh, very uh, striking. Next, please. Here I add some other countries and you can see at the end of the graph that all these island, uh, little island states, uh, Cyprus, Malta, uh, together with Greece, are now uh, supporting the bulk of the, of the burden, let's say. Of, uh, uh, and uh, this is, of course, uh, a direct consequence of the Dublin regulation, which uh, 
widen the gap between the continental countries and the first line uh, country. At the beginning of the graph, Sweden uh, uh, played a very uh, active role, but stops before Germany, the Netherlands too, uh, Austria, etc. So you can see that uh, one of the consequences I would uh, draw from this uh, uh, balance, from this balance sheet, is the fact that, yes, a state, uh, we must put the state back in. Uh, the transnational theory is the idea that uh, the immigrants can uh, cross borders uh, very easily uh, is no longer true. It's, it is still uh, valid for ordinary migration, like uh, uh, rights-based migration due to, the, for example, the family unification or the international students' migration. But as far as uh, asylum seeking is concerned, uh, the state, unfortunately, has now a very important role, contrary to what some theories had, um, uh, had said. And uh, I think this is my last slide. Next, please. Here is uh, a summary of the, the efforts uh, made by each uh, uh, European countries. I've controlled for the population of uh, each destination country and also the uh, variations in GDP. And uh, the result is strange. Germany and, uh, and Austria, for example, are still in the first rank, but together with Malta, with Cyprus, with Greece. And uh, you can see uh, that a lot of countries, for example, the countries from the ex-communist bloc, not familiarized at all with non-European migration, no colonial past, etc., are completely in the last ranks. Italy and Spain have uh, also the problem that they were not accustomed to welcome uh, exiles and uh, were much, much more accustomed to send exiles uh, abroad. And uh, the position of France and UK is uh, remarkable at the bottom of the first part of the graph. We, France, uh, the French, uh, as a in this graph, it summarizes what has been done uh, since 2015. We are more or less at half of the uh, European average and UK half of the half. So, uh, strangely enough, the public debate in each country is comp it does not measure uh, the, this uh, variation. Each country is absolutely convinced that uh, it is uh, the most important uh, country in Europe uh, by the number of uh, exiles, uh, asylum seekers uh, registered, and uh, etc. This is not the case. We have still a, a lot of efforts, first to uh, intervene in the public debate in order to re-establish the facts, and also to understand what are the determinants, what are the factors of such huge variations between the most uh, uh, receptive and the less uh, receptive countries. And I think that this uh, research cannot be, uh, of course, uh, uh, needs a qualitative research, needs observation at the local level, not only at the national level, as I did it. So this was just an introduction for our debate. Thank you very much.